Um, <laughs> I am the, uh, the tutor for the computers, which um, because of my web design certificate, I had to take Jay's Illustrator and Photoshop, which qualifies me to tutor you guys also. We can do one-time tutoring, so let's say you're just having a problem on the assignment you're working on now, you can't figure it out, you can come in and set up a one-time. Or if you think that you might struggle or just want someone to bounce ideas off or to help you with it so the whole semester, you can sign up for long-term tutoring, which I'll be more than happy. We still have some slots for that. And next week, I'll be announcing an open lab, which will be a time where if you, you have time and you just have one simple question or five simple questions, you can just come in and you don't have to sign anything. Just come in and I can help you. And I'll be giving Jay those times next week for the open lab. And the way it works is, um, because Jay has this room so much during the day and stuff, I'm actually in the business building, and if you don't know where that is, I'll be more than happy to show you. It's back that way. I'm on the second floor, and I have access to study rooms that have this, the Adobe suites on them. So we actually have a study room that we can go in there, and we don't have to worry about lab times or fitting in here and there. And I do work Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. I'm here five days a week, but that's also because I'm a student. But Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays, and I've got some in the evening. Um, still available if you're looking at any times that you need any help feel free to just stop by the student success center which is across from the cafeteria they will just tell them you need help with uh, with Photoshop I'm the only person so they will get you to me and we can get you scheduled and and try to sign up before it gets an issue because you don't want to get behind in your work because then you're gonna just get overwhelmed and then you're gonna have more and more stuff to try to catch up and then you get more confused as you go so it's best if you're struggling now, come see me. Let's get you on course and then go on. And if you need help the whole semester, I'm more than happy to help you all semester long. That's why I'm here. I did pass out three little flyers. One is for the online um, tutoring. There's not much there for mass media or for that, but there is for some of your other courses, English, math, stuff like that, which is available to all students. There's one for the Student Success Center, which has the phone number on there. You can call and ask questions, tutors, and all sorts of different subjects. So if you're struggling in anything, don't hesitate to, to take advantage of this. It's free to you as a student. And then here's, of course, the exam lab hours for the fall and the spring, the semester, just in case you have to make something up or, or take something. And that's about it, I think. Okay. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Take your mic. Thank you for coming by. So I'm glad that she came by and told us about uh, those services that we have available to us. And, uh, you know, I will, of course, offer you guys as much support as I can, but sometimes because of my availability, you know, my office hours, and then, you know, I'm advisor to the student publication, you know, you may not be able to get larger chunks of time with me. So Heather can definitely help you, help you out with that. Which, that's, that's quite a bit of time. Yeah, that's quite a bit. And online students are welcome too. You don't have to be a face-to-face -face student. Yeah. She just she just said that online students are welcome too. Yeah, I forgot to say I, that. That's okay. <laughs> I'm not sure if she could if, if she's getting picked up by the other mic. A little bit. So I don't think that you guys are heard as well. Okay, well thank you for coming. I appreciate I will see it. You around then. All right, and now I have to do Okay, Chuck's not here. Like, why is Chuck not here? What's up with that? Okay. Uh, Stephanie's moving around on me. Renee's here. Dan, I knew wasn't going to be here. Mike's here. Uh, let's see. I lost my place. Cassie's here. Jolene's not here. Come on. Someone, if you know her, give her a hard time. Mandy's here. Zach is here. Trina's here. John's here. Chantel's here. Allie's here. Jamie's here. And now's the part where I have to. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's down to two. I'm going to go with Ashley. Yes. And I was right. <laughs> I am the smartest man alive. Wow, that's a big bold statement. Oh, I just, <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I can't actually say that. That's Adam Sandler's the smartest man alive. <laughs> Are you suggesting something? Huh? I don't have a drinking problem. This is just coffee. It's iced tea. No, this is, this is coffee today. Unless Cassie spiked it. Okay. So <laughs> you should have you should have already today turned in the benchmarks and the Zenith Design logo and the cooking. If you're having I know I had someone who had trouble with uploading, uh, and I will if if you're still having some difficulties, I expect hiccups 
in the first couple of weeks. So I, after I'm done lecturing, we're going to have some time today to actually work on the computers. And so uh, I, I'd be glad to help you guys with that then. So, and, and just a kind of a point of order, I don't mind you guys coming before class and asking for help, but if I say, you know, I will help you with that after I'm done with lecture. Please don't think me rude. Uh, before class, I usually have a couple things I'm trying to work out, and it's just it's easier for me to work those things out once I'm through lecture instead of, you know, maybe starting class late. Um, let's see here. We're going to talk about some more imaging basics uh, today. Uh, basically, what are the different types of graphics that we have? Uh, and what exactly Photoshop is in relation to those different types of graphics, uh, how graphics are created. We're also going to talk uh, a little bit more about some other basics of uh, fo uh, digital photography. Uh, particularly, we're going to talk about some of the foundations of color. Uh, and then we're going to get into talking about layers and going through uh, some of the different functionality that you're going to see with layers in Photoshop. And then the last thing we'll do is we'll talk about the shooting assignment for next week, uh, the, which is, of course, uh, on depth of field. Uh, if you're online, it's actually due tomorrow. Sorry, because I'm sure the online people are hearing this and going, what? They have until next week? That's terrible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, if you're in the classroom section, you get more time. Um, and I, I'll actually do a demo. I brought a camera, and I'm going to show you guys, uh, because I know some of it, some of it you guys may not actually have cameras with some of the functionality so I want to talk to you about how you what you know what you can do and then show you you know if you did have a camera that had uh, some higher range of aperture what is available to you so that you get a little bit so at least you understand what that is uh, so imaging basics uh, we have basically we have two types of graphics all computer graphics all types of computer graphics I think it's picking some of that up, so I'm going to stop for a second. <laughs> Thanks, <laughs> Allie. Sharpen your pencil when I'm broadcasting. Okay. Uh, so there's a, all, all digital graphics are going to fall into two categories. Uh, and those two categories are raster and vector. So it doesn't matter what you see, what graphic you see in a digital environment, it is either a raster graphic or a vector graphic. So I want to talk about what that means what the differences are, and then, of course, identify what Photoshop is. Uh, actually, I'm going to ask you guys uh, if you can tell me which applies to Photoshop, raster or vector. Who can tell me that? Raise your hand. No, say it out loud. Come on. Yes, uh, Jamie is absolutely right. Uh, Photoshop is raster graphics software. So let's talk about what that actually means now. Raster graphics are pixel-based which we talked about last week. So the graphics are actually created point by point by point, or more accurately, rectangle by rectangle by rectangle. So all the graphics are is just a series, a grid of rectangles that are assigned a color value. And we're going to talk about how that color value is actually assigned, how it's created here in a little bit. Vector graphics is a little bit different. Uh, and we actually are, are uh, I'll step back here. Uh, we, he did say that, but of course, Photoshop is raster graphics. Uh, we have another class, a uh, computer graphics class, that we use Illustrator for. Illustrator would be an example of a vector graphics program. Now, vector graphics are going to be different from raster graphics in that instead of having a series of pixels laid out on a grid, we're actually going to have a point, another point, and the software will calculate a line in between. That's how it's drawn. Okay, so it's, it's not a series of pixels. Uh, it's math-based. And so there's, there are some advantages and disadvantages to each of these types of graphics. There are certain situations in which you absolutely should or must use raster graphics, and there are situations in which you should or must use vector graphics. Vector graphics are going to be uh, primarily used for simpler drawings, uh, things like cartoons, and logos. The images, uh, they don't necessarily have to have a limited number, a number of colors because we have the same possible amount of colors available to us in a vector environment that we do in a raster graphic environment, but they tend to be simpler and use fewer colors. 
And the primary benefit of vector, vector graphics, this is really the big one here. This is one of the most important things with vector graphics. Vector graphics are scalable. Because it's mathematically calculated, because we have that point and that point, and then we calculate the line in between, if we increase the size of the graphic or decrease the size of the graphic, it's still a point and a point and a line calculated in between. This is why it's important to use vector graphics for certain situations like logo design. You know, most logos you design to look good at maybe like an inch by an inch. A good logo should look good that small. But there are all kinds of applications in which you might want to use a graphic at a, a logo at a much larger, larger size. You know, banners, big posters, billboards, whatever. So if if you want to have that scalability, you need to make that logo in a vector environment. You should never design a logo in a raster environment, and we'll talk about why. Okay, we talked about how this is great, it's great scale, that we have this scalability. Let's talk about raster now. Uh, raster graphics, primary use, uh, for, particularly for this class, is photographs. Your digital camera actually captures raster graphics. Uh, there is no camera that captures vector graphics, and I, I hesitate to say that that would never, I'm sorry, vector graphics. I hesitate to say that would never happen. It doesn't make sense to me that it would ever happen. To, I, 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 I'm, I feel fairly certain that you're not going to see a camera that's going to capture vector graphics anytime soon. And if it does, we do get to the point it's probably going to be some kind of specialty thing. So photographs are always going to be raster graphics. Raster graphics typically are going to be images that are going to ha be more complex. They're going to have more colors. They're going to have more subtle shading uh, and uh, gradual tone changes. And it says primary benefit is the ability to handle uh, millions of colors. But uh, really, we can have the same number of colors with vector graphics. It's, it just, it's just far more complex if you were to try to create something in a vector environment that had a higher number of co uh, colors. So more colors more easily with raster graphics. <coughs> now there is a downfall to raster graphics. There's a reason why we use it for some, Im some uh, types of uh, illustrations, images, but that we wouldn't want to use it for others. Photoshop is an incredibly powerful illustration tool. You can create artwork with Photoshop very easily. I just actually said a couple of minutes ago, however, that you should never design a logo in a Photoshop, Photoshop environment or Astro Graphics environment. And that is because it is not scalable. You do not have the scalability. It is true that you will find through your use of Photoshop that there are some pieces of vector functionality, but largely Photoshop, digital photography, is going to be uh, raster graphics and it is not going to scale well. So what does that mean, it's not going to scale, scale well? Raster graphics, of course, like we talked about, they're pixel based. They're made up of a lot of small dots, small rectangles arranged on a grid. When a raster graphic is enlarged, there a couple of different things can, can possibly happen. All of these things that are going to happen are going to essentially result in a degradation of quality. Now one of the most simple things that we'll see happen is when we increase the size of the raster gra image, the pixels are enlarged and you actually will get to the point where you can actually see the pixels. And I'm sure you've had experiences where you've uh, you had a graphic, you tried to make it larger and then you can actually begin to see it, it, we, we call it, it, it got the jaggies. Or, you know, it be, you, be, you actually began to see the little rectangles that at one point in time were little and now are much larger. So, uh, there are certain types of graphics you always want to design in a vector environment. And, and Jolene, unbelievable. Sorry. I was out on the and then I had to take somebody to the safe house. Okay. Well, you'll have to catch up with the notes and then I'm recording as well. So, you'll be able to. That's okay. I, I, I don't expect that my broadcast, no, you're allowed to talk. I don't expect that it's perfect anyway. I, I'm sure that people watching this are going to be like, my God, I can't hear anything. Why doesn't he say, why doesn't he repeat their questions? I'm sure I'm making all kinds of mistakes. All right, uh, vector graphics. Like I said, it's drawn mathematically. We have, we have points and lines defined, curves or straight lines called vectors that are calculated in between. 
every time we change the size of a vector graphic, it's just simply recalculated. The computer recalculates it at that new size. And so every time we increase the size of it, we are going to have a nice, cl crisp, clear graphic. So we literally can just continually enlarge that graphic. I could take a logo that is designed in a vector environment and enlarge it to, to be printed on the moon, which I, I, somebody probably has thought of that already, That's, which is really sad. <laughs> I wonder if I could get the moon and put a logo. Let's put the McDonald's logo on the moon. There was or Walmart. There was actually an article that I had read where they wanted to take satellites that are no longer in use and have turned satellites into projectors to project advertisement on the moon. Nice. Oh, my word. Wow. Because wow. so that's what I want to see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I want yeah, to. Well, no, the theory was that if they projected it just right, that you would be able to see the I could just see that, you know, the full harvest moon comes up, it's low in the sky, the it's moon appears large. to be so <laughs> large, it's beautiful, it's orange, and then there's a logo on it. I would be ticked off. Yeah. yeah. Hopefully this never happens. This is like, you, you would say that these, these are the things that like, you know, sci-fi novels are made of, but you know, I, I actually, I, I potentially, potentially. I mean, think about it. When when the moon is lowest in the sky, it appears largest. So yeah. So and I, and I like to think that this stuff would never happen, but I'm I'm a Kurt Vonnegut fan, and some of the stuff that he wrote, it, that that at the time was like, you know, most people will be like, oh God, that'll never happen. Yeah, it's happening. <laughs> anyway, okay. So raster vector summary. Uh, they both have their place. They're, neither is completely superior to the other. There are simply appropriate places for each of them. Raster graphics uh, are standard for photos, uh, illustrations with lots of colors, subtle shading, more, some, sometimes more complex graphics. Which is, you know, and of course this is what we're doing in here. We're not going to be using vector graphics often. In fact, the most, one of some of the most notable Vector graphics, or excuse, vector graphics capabilities Photoshop has, I'm not even going to cover in this class. That's, uh, I don't do typography in the digital photography class anymore because you shouldn't be using Photoshop for typography. Uh, and then vector images are of course best for drawings that may need to be resized. So if you're creating something that you may want to increase the size of at some point in time, it should probably be designed in a vector environment. Yes ma'am. Typography, like type, it's letters. Yeah, so this is typography. Okay, so like when you put like words or something over a photograph? Yes. So which, which some people will murder you for. <laughs> I actually was just at the Wyoming Press oh, Association yeah. Conference this weekend. Oh, what's that? Wouldn't you want to have to do like an address signature? I, potentially, but it's not the, the what they have in the book is I, I'm not going to make you guys go through the exercises because uh, I don't think that you necessarily need to do that in order to understand how to do that. And then there's just not enough time in the class. Uh, but uh, I was just at the Wyoming Press Association conference this last weekend, and I sat in. They did a photo critique. They have this competition for all the newspapers across Wyoming. All the photographers submit their work. The winning photographer for uh, the the sweepstakes uh, was from Cheyenne, by the way, Mike Smith, who works at the Truman Eagle, and he's fantastic. His work is incredible. You guys should be looking at his stuff. He's very, very good. Uh, but uh, there was actually, they were going through all the photographs that had been entered, and they were talking about why they chose this photo the photograph for, you know, this or that or the other. And uh, it ca they came up with this one photograph that they really liked the photograph, but there was a headline on the photograph and then they had put, they had kind of put a box with some, uh, a cut line over the lower right hand portion and the judges were very, very unhappy about this. There are some photographers that they will tell you never, 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 never mortis, t mortis text on a, on a photograph. I don't know that I'm, uh, that I agree with that. In fact, I've, I mortis text all the time, but there are some photographers that, you know, I, in fact, I say a lot of things in here that would get me, you know, shot by some photographers, so. And not with a camera. What's that? We're telling. Yeah, go right ahead. I have a question. Actually, you said topography is best as, you say, In a vector environment. 
Yeah, I don't, I don't teach typography in this class for a couple of reasons. Uh, there are some type features in Photoshop that are, that are great, but it's not something that we have a lot of, we don't have a lot of time in this class. It's a, it's, if this class just goes too fast for me to really give typography and you know, serve any purpose with talking about typography in this class. And I believe for most applications, when you are working with typography, Photoshop is not the appropriate environment. Like I know photographers, they'll design, they'll design business cards and brochures in Photoshop, and it drives me crazy. It just, it's, an, it's just, it's insanity to me. Uh, InDesign or Illustrator would be what I would advocate. If you're doing something that's type heavy, you should be editing your photos in Photoshop, but designing in InDesign or Illustrator, depending on what you're doing. All right. Oh, Jamie's giving me the. Oh yeah, well, I'm done Photoshop anyway. Take that, O'Brien. <laughs> All right. Uh, pixels per PPI, pixels per inch. I'm sure you've heard this t term. Uh, and I, I, we've talked a couple of times about how raster images are made up of little squares. Uh, but I wanted to talk about uh, really how large these squares are. Because this is kind of an interesting uh, discussion for most folks. They, they typically don't understand what this is. Uh, essentially, what this comes down to is that a pixel is as large as we tell the computer or the image to, to make the pixel. We decide how large the pixel is. There is no set size or actual size or optimal size or standard size for a pixel. So we can change the size of the pixels based on uh, our preferences or our output. Okay, so and output is one of the key things here that gets us to this next thing here. I have a couple of different standard resolutions. Resolutions being, they're, they're rectangles. Pixels are rectangles. I think squares. It's. I don't know that they're actually perfect squares, and, and I hesitate to say that they are perfect no, squares. No, like the measurements of it, they're like point yeah. something different. I always say rectangles because I don't, I, I, I'm, I'm yet to see uh, an environment or a camera that's actually capturing or working with perfectly square pixels. You they're typically. Well, I apologize. They're rec. I. I well, that, well, that's that's fairly close to accurate. They're square-like. They're actually rectangles. It's what your eye will pick up when you're going through and looking at them. When you go through and magnify your your images and stuff on the screen, you go through and blow it up to 400 or 600 percent. Your eye is going to recognize it as a square. Yeah. And it's very close. It's like the difference between you know a circle and a perfect circle. You know. Uh, that kind of thing. I mean, yes, it appears to be a very, very close to a perfect square, but I, it's not actually a perfect square. Okay, so we decide how many pixels there are in a given area, an inch. That is our resolution. That is the quality of the image, how you know fine the image is. Uh, I have a couple of standard resolutions up here that perhaps you've heard of, because we have so many people here who are here. Uh, who are pursuing web certificates, I certainly hope that you've heard of some of this. We have 72 pixels per inch and 300 pixels per inch. And what do you think those describe for us? Is this the math thing? <laughs> There's going to be some math. You're, you're going to be upset with me in a second because there is going to be some math. Oh, no. It's the resolution that you go through and make your photographs for the web pages for loading purposes. It's visually a uh, pleasing to people. <coughs> um, you can read it. It's printable. We're going we're to make it s simpler than that. And, and I actually take issue with the printable part. Okay, 72 pixels per inch is our standard web resolution. Okay, what would 300 be? Pixels per inch. Okay, print. And Mandy, you shouldn't look at me like you're confused. You've teched photos for Wingspan before. <laughs> Okay, so 72 pixels per inch is our standard web resolution. 300 pixels per inch is our standard print resolution. That's what we have here. So web so standard designing, and then high quality print standard. So when you're designing, if you're designing for print, you want to make sure your resolution is 300. Yeah, that's a good standard. Now there are some photographers and some outputs 
that will tell you it doesn't have to be 300. So I'm not going to sit here. I, I'm, I'm calling 300 a standard because that is, I mean, widely accepted as a standard print resolution. Uh, but there are different output processes that might actually be able to handle a finer quality resolution, so more pixels per inch. And then there are some photographers, including uh, very w highly regarded photographers. Uh, the one I'm thinking of right now is there's a, a, a photographer and a writer uh, named Scott Kelby uh, who I follow and he argues that you actually, even if, you, if you're printing like on an inkjet printer, that uh, really there's not a lot of visual difference between an image that's printed with 144 pixels per inch and 300. Yeah. I think there yeah. is. And I, and, I, and, I think, and I think that I there's think some truth to I, And he's a pretty smart guy. So I, and I think there's some truth to that. But um, I, I, I think that depending on the output, you would definitely be able to see a difference. Now, is it discernible to most folks? Probably not. So, and, and I think that's what he's talking about is, you know, do you absolutely have to have... 300 pixels per inch. And if his standpoint is, he's probably, and of course this was a few years ago when I read the article where he said this. And I'm sure his standpoint is, at that time we had cameras that were capable of capturing, you know, 10 megapixels. And so you have professional photographers that are running around with cameras that have 10 megapixels and they want to produce, you know, prints that are 30 by 40 something huge. And so this, this, I'm sure this discussion centered around what can I get away with? Can I print really, really big prints and the, and the quality will be acceptable? So, and, so I can just certainly see that. And, I, and there's probably still people who are pushing that. But obviously the cameras that we have now, I mean, most, well, and I don't, and I don't know that most people actually need this. It's overkill for so many people. But, I mean, most people are running around with a camera that's shooting 18, 20 megapixels. So, yeah. So, my first digital camera, uh, excuse me, well, actually, yeah, I'll talk about my first, I still have this in, in my office. I, my first digital camera was a one megapixel uh, Hewlett Packard. And it was like a little brick. And it still functions. It still works. I still have it. Uh, and it's, uh, it was hilarious because it came with a compact flash card, which was a big deal back when I got this. this well, I got this in 2000. People didn't have digital cameras in 2000. And this was, this was a big deal that I had this thing. It was a one megapixel, the compact flash card. Are you ready for this? Four megabytes. It was enormous. I could get eight high quality images on that card before it was full. It was just incredible. I love that camera. And, it, and I, 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 it was a graduation gift, and I, and I think I, eight? four, eight, eight, eight images. Eight images. Yeah, yes. that's all it would. That's all it would do. And it was, and it ran on AA batteries, and I could probably capture four or five images. I couldn't actually shoot eight images without having to change the batteries. Oh my the camera just died. It had an LCD screen on it. It was, which is which was awesome, which only partially functions now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It still works though. I still have this camera and it still works. It's hilarious. I tried to get my daughter to use it several years ago when she wanted a, a camera and, <laughs> and I even put a, a larger memory card in. I was like, yeah, go have fun. Shoot with this. Come on. Have a ball. Yeah, it wasn't cool enough. Oh, so, man. yeah. <laughs> uh, and then I, the reason why I, I, I was talking about my cameras is that be, the, my first DSLR, and it, which is right here, I want to show you guys, you know, why was my Nikon D70. And it's got... Uh, I want to say five or six megapixel sensor. And uh, really, that's what the, mo the most that most people need. You got all these, and, I, and I'm not meaning to sound insulting to anyone, you got all these soccer moms running around with 20 megapixel DSLRs, and they're only shooting automatic, and they're printing five by sevens. Ma well, maybe five by sevens, probably four by sixes because they're cheaper. <laughs> yeah, they look exactly. They look awesome doing it. So they have this camera that is completely overkill, has like four times the amount of resolution that they need, and all this functionality that they're never going to touch. So I, I still shoot my D70, and I love it. I still love that camera. And I'm very proud of the fact that I've had it as long as I have, and there's only two little things wrong with it. You know why they have those cameras? 
is because they can go through and stand on the sideline, shoot clear across the field, and they've got yes. 400 feet out there, and they crop it down to 25. Yes, I can. And still have a good image. <laughs> I, I would argue it's still not a good image, though. Uh, I agree. So, but it yeah. And for the folks at home, Jamie just said that they have that so that they can shoot from across the field or from the stands, and I watch them do that. I sit next to a mom that has like a 300 millimeter lens on her Canon T3i and shoots the basketball game from way up in the, like you know, you know, 20th row of the stands. And when I shoot a game, even though it's just my son, I get down and I go down and I, I get underneath the hoop. So yeah, so and that's how you should shoot something like that. Don't shoot from the stands. Although sometimes they'll get mad at you if there's too many people around. I got yelled at at a soccer game once. Yeah, so I, I, I got an in with the AD now. The AD knew who I, because I started supplying, what I did is I started supplying the school some of my photographs. So now they don't mind so much. They don't care if I'm down there because I'm giving them my photos. So anyway, I, got, I get lots of good pictures of my kids. All right, so uh, the higher number of the pixels per inch, like we talked about, finer detail in image, that's, you know, uh, that's the finer detail that's capable. There are some processes that actually will take advantage of that. There are some, uh, you know, not, I'm not talking about Walmart and Walgreens, where most of us get our photos printed. I'm talking about there are actually professional quality printing houses. I don't even think there's one in Wyoming. In fact, the, I, the folks that I know who are professional photographers, they send theirs to South Dakota. So, yeah, I, I would imagine, that I just, I, I've not yet met anyone who's doing business with them, so, but there's, apparently there's a really good one in South Dakota somewhere. Uh, so, web images are printed, uh, we are printed, are created at a lower resolution because we're saving file size. Everything, we're optimizing for the web. We don't want to wait forever for things to load. In fact, I appreciate those of you who, when you submit your homework, you downsize it for me. Because there's some people that, like, they turn their homework, I'm like, Okay, I, like I, I was just grading some depth of field photos today for my online section, and I clicked on one, and then I moved over, and I clicked on another one, and then I waited, and I waited, That's and I waited, and I waited as it was, and and, and it's like you know you can actually see it like yeah 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 depending yeah. on your bandwidth. So, so you want us to down? <laughs> you don't have to. I don't want you guys, particularly right now, because it we're we're new. I certainly do do not expect it. But if you understand how to to. Uh, change the uh, size of your image and and you'd like to do that it's fine I, I'm not I certainly don't want to get change, anyone twisted up over it you want us to change the resolution or the actual size of the photo? well that, that's that's an interesting question which leads because it's uh, it's actually it, it's almost the same thing it is the same thing yeah well okay when we talk about this is one of these funny things with and this uh, now I'm gonna some people are gonna get really lost here <laughs> So, yeah, now I get to play with the smart board that I always argue with. <laughs> One of the funny things about pixels per inch and the quality of the image is that, you know, if folks don't understand what they're doing when they're changing things like pixels per inch, uh, th there's a bit of a math thing that's going on here. Oh, uh, yes, I know, there she goes. She's, she's really unhappy with me now because I said the word math. Math, 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 math. There's going to be more math in a second. Let's talk about this real quickly here. And this is not something you need to, this is, I'm, I'm not going to quiz you on this. It's something good for you to know and understand, but it, I don't want you guys to get all, like I said, twisted up over it. Let me see if I can, I'm going to orient, orient to the smart board. Oh, no. And, oh, wait, I think I know how to fix this. Oh, look at how good I am with the smart board. Did you see that? Tell your friends. I don't hate the smart board, but I'm constantly fighting with the smart board. Well, okay, that's what I have to say. I'm constantly fighting with the smart board. You should never say hate. Okay, say dislike intensely. Okay, mom. <laughs> you know, I do have a 16-year-old at home, all right? I do have to keep that kind of stuff in mind, Joey. Yeah, I hate, <laughs> I, I love liver. Liver and onions is delicious. Okay. One of the strange things about uh, digital imaging that is, uh, can be a little bit uh, difficult for folks who are new to it to get their head around uh, is the idea that 
like an image that is this size physically, that is 300 pixels per inch, and an image that is this size physically at 72 pixels per inch, those two have, may have the exact same number of pixels in them. Okay? The pixels. That has to do. Yeah. There you go. Hey, right, um, she got it. I'm, I hope everyone gets it. Okay, because you have to think about, okay, so we'll say this. Now I have four inches here, and of course, this is not going to work out mathematically for me here. Maybe if I cheat it here. Okay, so. I think I gotta. <laughs> I'm probably doing this wrong mathematically, but we'll just you'll just have to imagine with me because I'm, I'm I'm I I don't think I can do it perfectly mathematically. This the there are 72 pixels in that inch. There are 300 pixels in that inch. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. And now now of course this is not perfect mathematically. Okay, so if I take this image that is 300 pixels per inch and I change the resolution of it to 72 pixels per inch, it increases in size physically, but it has the exact same number of pixels that it had before. And the same thing vice versa. And this does become important because, you know, like I, my, my Canon 7D and my Nikon D70, they shoot 300 pixels per inch when I shoot JPEG. So my images, when I download them, they are 300 pixels per inch. Some of you may have cameras that when you shoot, it's actually shooting 72 pixels per inch. Now, what that means is, is that you're going to have an image that when it downloads, it's, it has the same amount of information potentially, but it's going to appear much larger in physical size than an image that is shot at 300 pixels per inch. Because, the, you know, it's, we'll say, uh, let's talk about uh, sensor size and the actual, and I'm just going to create a new page here. Oh, wait, that's the wrong button. There we go. You know, we, we talk about our sensors uh, based on megapixels. Uh, but there was a time that serious photographers, they didn't, in fact, there was a time that s serious photographers frowned on the term megapixels. They didn't like it because they, they knew the exact size of their sensor. They, they didn't shoot, um, you, know, you know, so many megapixels. They shot, my sensor is 3,000 by 2,000. So, but that's, but your, your sensor is actually some management, uh, measurement like that. So your sensor shoots 3,000 pixels by 2,000 pixels, okay? If it's, if you have a, a 300 pixel per inch capture size, then it's gonna be, you know, we'll call, this will be 10 inches. But if it's 72 pixels per inch, and I'm not gonna try and do this here, it's gonna be somewhere around like 40 inches. It's roughly four times the physical size, even though it's the same exact same number of pixels. We're just changing our definition of the quality of the image. So then, it doesn't matter about changing the size. You need to change. The yeah. If so, the whole is the reason why we started talking about this, of course, was I was talking about. I appreciate students who change the size of their images. I I don't necessarily need to have something that's like. 4,500 pixels wide. So if you go in there and you change it to like 2,000, that's going to be plenty for me to evaluate your images. Even and some people do have cameras. Resolution? Not the resolution. The actual, like if you go into, and I'll show you, uh, and I, I'll show you in just a second here. Yeah, why don't I just uh, actually open it up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, but we're not going to talk about that until like the 14th week of this class. Okay. <laughs> um, is there a way to change how your camera is taking the picture, the size of the picture? Yes, and you'd have to actually find that in your camera's manual. You can tell your camera, I want to shoot this resolution. Most cameras are going to have that functionality. You can tell your camera, I want to shoot 300 pixels per inch. 
Now, I, I, most cameras, uh, a professional level or what we call, I'll call prosumer even level cameras, they're shooting 300 pixels per inch anyway. I'm, I'm going to call that a prosumer, but it's a really high prosumer, really high prosumer. You're not quite pro, but it's by no means a consumer level camera. Yeah, T3i. Another one that left me. All right, when you get there. All right, so let me just uh, show you what I'm talking about here. Uh, like, I'm going to, let me see. I have photos to play with on the network here. Where are they? All right, I went too far. No digital photography, photos to play with. Isn't it funny that I have a folder called photos to play with? So, I'll just, it doesn't matter which one I open. I have no idea what I'm opening. <laughs> Come on. You can do it. Oh, there. <laughs> yes. Um, if I change the resolution on my camera so that's making a lower uh, file oh, size of picture, and I choose to increase the file size with Photoshop, will it make it green? Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, and I'll, I will talk about this again later, and, and I'll try to be clear. This is part of a, a, a lecture that I'm going to give, and I'm, it might be next week. Resampling. What's that? Resampling. Yeah, well, resampling, yes. Uh, but m what, what I, the point I need to make to you about digital images is that you absolutely must capture at the so at least at the size that you plan to use an image. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be scanning images as well for like restorations. And this is something that's going to be really important for that. I you cannot, that. you cannot invent information. Well, which is only partially true. Yeah. You, you, <laughs> well, you can invent information, but bad things happen. There's going to be a problem with that. We will, yes, I am going to talk about resampling, but I'm going to tell you about the dangers and the evils of resampling. Okay, so, so because what, when you make it, would you take an image that is a particular, has a particular amount of information and you tell your computer, I want to make it have this amount of information. Where do you think that information comes from? Is, it's magic. <laughs> yeah, that's what's going to happen. And we'll talk more in detail, in detail more about that later. But basically, your computer is inventing things. It's like, I think this is what it should be, but I'm not really sure. And there are some problems with that. Okay? You're, you're asking your computer to guess, to just make stuff up. Okay? And we, but we will talk about that in more detail. You must capture. And I say capture because this is more about scanning in most cases than shooting. Although, if any of you, well, in some cases, like I said, there's the soccer moms that have the 20 megapixel cameras that probably don't need. I suppose you could actually tell your camera, I really only want you to shoot at like, you know, seven or eight megapixels. Yeah, you can, well, most cameras will adjust. You can, most cameras will give you the ability to tell it, I want this to be, and, and, and it may not tell you the actual size, it'll say like, you know, Fine, super fine. <laughs> I love it when they call things super fine. <laughs> um, so I wanted you to finish the sentence. Digital images you must capture at the size that you plan, at least at the size that you plan on using the image. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna, so if you're gonna, if you're gonna, if you're going to output an output meaning print or put on the web at I want it to be an 8 by 10. You better make sure that you have 8 by 10 at the, an acceptable resolution for whatever your output is. So if I want an 8 by 10 photograph and I'm going to print it, I want 8 by 10 and I want 300 pixels per inch. And I need to have at least that amount of information. So that what means if you're going for, like you said, an 8 by 10, or you want 11 by 14. Yeah, exactly. So that's the problem because people what will they'll do is they'll they'll scan or they'll take a photograph and it's five by seven, for instance, at three hundred pixels per inch, and then they'll decide I want this to be eight by ten, 
you can make it 8 by 10. You can tell your computer, I want this to be 8 by 10, but bad things are going to happen. Dogs and cats living together, mass hysteria. And who, what's, what line is that movie from? Who can tell me what line that movie's from? It is from Ghostbusters. Thank you, Casey. <laughs> uh, I'll, I, I, I just, this stuff is just sticks in my head. So you can't fix that from 5 by 7 to 8 by 10 because there's just not enough. You, you can increase the size of that, but you have to accept right. if I do this, there is going to be degradation of quality. Just not enough information. Yeah, because okay. you're asking your computer to either just make the, pix up. make the pixels bigger, which means you're making big boxes out of little boxes, or you're asking your computer to guess. Mm -hmm. okay, so yes. Right now, I See, and this is why I can't get through a lecture, you guys. Sorry, That's you okay. <laughs> I don't mind. No, I'm happy to do it. It's fine. Right now, I think my camera takes pictures the size of like a giant poster, mm -hmm. and I'm saving all these on my computer. But, if, so it would be better to continue to allow it to do that, but mass resize the files once I get them if I'm not going to... If you know that you absolutely never will use that information, that you will never print at a size that requires you to have that information, you could actually tell your camera to shoot at a lower quality. I would not do that because you can never, I don't know that you can actually say that. I capture at the, obviously at the highest quality that my camera will allow because you know, even though I don't think I'm going to make poster size prints, I might decide to do that. I think with some of the action shots I do, I might want to, but the snapshots of my son, like, I don't think that needs to be a poster pretty much ever. Maybe not. Facebook, yeah. Actually. Yeah. So, Facebook does some ma magic things for you, though. Yeah. And I will tell you guys that this will be something I'll reiterate later, but uh, you can't use a photograph that you've downloaded for Facebook for an assignment for this class because Facebook and its efforts to do really nice things for you. When you upload photographs to Facebook, we talked about optimizing for web so everything moves fast. When you upload your photographs to Facebook, Facebook's really nice. They resize your photographs for you. Yes. Yes. So when you upload that really enormous 20 megapixel image that you have, and then you think, oh, well, I got that on Facebook. I can delete that from my computer. And then you download it from Facebook. It's not 20 megapixels anymore. Oh, yeah. 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 But I'll have students, though, like, they'll, uh, for the retouching project, I'll say, you know, you have to choose a photograph. And then they'll say, oh, can you come look at these photographs over here? And they'll have their Facebook up. And I'll say, no. Their are too and yet, people manage to do it anyway. I don't get that. Like, I have like 500 photos I like to put on Facebook right now, and it's, it's not working out. Yeah. If you go into image, whoops, image size, see how this image, and this is, this is actually just to give you an idea, image, image size. This is, uh, this camera, this was shot on my 7D, or sorry, D70, and it has, 3,000 by 2,000 essentially. So imagine how big your images are that are, you know, 20 megapixels. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what my, my 7D is, my Canon. It's, it's huge. Yeah, it's big. <laughs> that's big information. That's lots of information. And the reason why this is resolution 240 is because I actually, um, I, I opened it in camera raw, which don't worry about what that means right now. So you're <laughs> in the big of mansions. Yeah. Well, yeah. And so I would actually, like, if, if I was going to turn this in, I might just, like, type 2,000. But then I would save another version because I don't want to save over my original and destroy that information. Can you say that? Yes. What? Because I may want that information for myself later on. But, yeah, so wouldn't you open it up and paste it into another one? I would just save as. Save as. Now, I might actually save as first thing. If, in fact, when I'm working on images and I'm manipulating images, and I will talk a lot about non-destructive e editing in this class. In fact, that's one of the big things with layers, non-destructive editing. You do not want to destroy your original information. You don't want to damage your original photographs. So if I'm working on a project, 
one of the things that I'll do, I'll open the photograph and almost every single time I'm working on a photograph, the first thing I do, the absolute first thing I do is go to file, save as and create a new version of the document. So, so that if yeah, I'll have an, an original document that's this DSC zero two nine three, and then I'll actually add something to the name or create a, change the file format to PSD or whatever, so that I have a working document. In fact, I can show you here. I actually have an example of. <laughs> See this one here, Ash Seniors 094, Ash Seniors 094 PSD, Ash Seniors 094B, Ash Seniors 094B flat, Ash Seniors 094B flat PSD, Ash Seniors 094 demo start PSD, Ash Seniors 094 original. And I'll do that with an image because I mean if when you're like if you're doing senior portraits, you might have, you know, you'll have the original photograph. Then you'll have one that you've color corrected and retouched. Then you'll have one that you've applied some artistic effect to. And you want to make sure that no matter what you do, if you decide, you know what, everything I did looks like crap. <laughs> you can go back and you've got the original image still. It's not damaged, it's not been destroyed. And you can do that through creating different versions of the file and then of course using layers as you're editing. Do I have bad breath or something? What's going on here? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I, that was a pretty good segue there. Or not segue, tangent. <laughs> tangential, but it's easy to do. That's a school word. Yeah. She, she's got a PhD in psychology. Don't mess nice. with her. <laughs> All right. I can't figure out a simple mask. Yeah, but math, if, if, you, if you want to make her cry, just bust out a couple of math equations. She'll leave you alone. <laughs> okay, so, so like I said, uh, web, size, uh, web images, we have a lower resolution, we're saving file space, we're, it's optimizing speed, it makes the things load faster. Uh, but for printed projects, we want the larger file size. Uh, a little note here at the bottom, uh, you'll see the term PPI and then you'll see DPI. These are not necessarily interchangeable. Pixels per inch refers to the quality of an image in a digital environment. Pixels are digital. That is in the computer. DPI refers to the quality of input and output devices. Input being that scanner back there in the back of the room. It has a, a certain quality that it will scan at that is measured in dots per inch. This printer outputs at a quality that is measured in dots per inch. Okay? Yes. So, pixels per inch in a digital environment, did dots per inch input or output device. So, if they are so different and I scan something, what am I going by? The yeah, well, once you've scanned it, you know, like if, if with the scanner, and this is where the, there's there's some interchangeability. I say they're not inter interchangeable, but there's some interchangeability. If I'm scanning on uh, on that scanner back there, and I tell it, it has a certain amount of dots per inch that it can capture, but I'm going to tell it how many pixels per inch I want. Okay. Okay. Well, it, it's the dots per inch is how much, what it is capable of. But I will tell it what quality I want. And this is one of those things where you have to understand image quality because that scanner back there, when you guys start scanning images, it's going to default to 100 pixels per inch, which is the most ridiculous default setting ever because nobody uses 100 pixels per inch. Nobody. It's, it's not for web, it's not for print, it's for nothing. So you actually have to tell it, you know, that you want more information because lots of people who bring in, you know, a photograph that's this size for restoration and they'll put it on there and they'll just scan it and they'll accept the default settings. The problem is they don't have enough information. This is another key point that I'll reiterate throughout the class. When we get into retouching and restoration, when you are 
manipulating a photograph. The more information you have, the easier your life will be. If you have an image that is of too low resolution, that is too low in quality, the tools that we edit with in Photoshop won't have as much information to work with and will not function as well. So it actually makes your life harder. So don't do that. I, I like to say work smart, not hard. Although it's perfectly okay to work smart and hard. Yeah. Well, the thing is, though, if somebody brings you a photograph that this is all I have, this is it. But you can scan. Okay, a photograph may have more information than you would typically consider at a quality oh, of 300 pixels per inch. When I do restoration projects, I'll capture at 600 or 1200 pixels per inch. You mean when you're scanning? Yes. What's that? I'm sure I can, but the, like I said, these computers, they all reset. They just reset. I, so I can't actually change anything on these. <laughs> but it's good to, it, it's, I suppose it's good in a way because, that, you know, we're talking about it and it's something people need to be aware of because even if I change the default on that, am I then doing you guys a disservice because you're going to go someplace else and use somebody else's default settings and they're just as screwed up. <laughs> All right. So file size. So there's some different things that go into the file size. Uh, we just talked about the quality of the image. Uh, we, and we also, you know, the quality of the image and then, of course, the size of the image. But then we also have this additional thing called bit depth. And we're going to talk about bit depth because it's going to help us to understand the foundations of the color of the image, which is going to come into play later in the semester when we talk about color correction. So there's going to be math here. Jolene, it's going to be okay. All right? We're going to be all right. Where is Daniel? <laughs> Daniel was not feeling well today. Okay, so bit depth. Uh, bit depth uh, is, uh, is literally going to come down to ones and zeros. If we have a single bit, this is binary code. So this is like, you know, really basic computer stuff here. A bit can be one of two things, a one or a zero, which, you know, and this is actually kind of an important thing to talk about because all of our, every piece of software, every piece of equipment that we have, this is fundamentally how these things operate. Yes. I thought they were wrong. Yeah. All uh, it all comes down to binary code. They, when, when the programmers are actually uh, programming, it's not like they're actually putting in ones and zeros. They're like right. one, one, zero, one, zero, zero, zero. There's, there, are other co there are other programming languages that are based on that binary code. But it's also important to remember uh, th that we have this because this is how our cameras are going to capture. It's going to write ones and zeros that describe our photographs. And Photoshop, while incredibly powerful, is also stupid. The, the computer and the, and the camera, they don't understand, it doesn't understand what you're doing. When you pick your camera up and point it at Jamie, the camera doesn't understand that's a portrait. When you point the camera at a mountain, the camera doesn't understand that's a, that that's a landscape. When you bring those images into Photoshop, Photoshop doesn't understand that that's a portrait or a landscape. It just sees ones and zeros that describe amounts of light. That's what this is going to come down to. Uh, now, I love to talk about uh, bitmaps here because you guys know bitmaps is something completely different from what I learned bitmaps as. Back in the, when I was uh, new to this uh, technology, a bitmap really was a bitmap uh, because a bitmap only had, they were, uh, they were black and white. There are only two possible values, a one or a zero, on or off, black or white. That was it. So a bitmap image was literally a series of pixels that were either white or black. And that was, you know, 
early on with graphics, that's what we had. But we started adding bit depth, okay? We started adding bits to this so that we'd have more than black and white, so to get more color. Grayscale images have a bit depth of eight. We now have eight bits. They each have a possibility of being one or zero, and this is math now, if we combine all that, two to the eighth, there's two possibilities, two times 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 two, times two. we now have 256 possible values of gray. X, I, you know, I'm so glad you get that, Jolene. So grayscale images, that's how grayscale images are gonna be created. Most of us are going to be working with what we call 8-bit RGBs. <laughs> and it's important to understand why it's called an 8-bit RGB, because I just said that a grayscale image is 8 bits. We call them 8-bit RGBs, even though there's actually 24 bits, because our RGB images, our digital AM images, are actually three grayscale images that are then composited together each of those grayscale images are assigned a color of light, red, green, or blue, and that's how we create our digital photographs, our color images. Well, when you say assigned together, you just mean like each... Is that Your camera actually reads different colors of light when it creates images. It reads red light, green light, blue light. So you're actually getting three what will appear to be grayscale images. Like if I bring... Well, if, it's, if it's combined together like yellow and yes. blue and green, right? Yes. Like this image here, if I go to my channels, which you guys haven't been asked to do yet, <laughs> and I look at my channels, and I'm going to blow them up after I fight with the smart board. I can make my thumbnails really big. You can see that I have the RGB image, which is completely, you know, full color. We have all the information, that's what we see. But then we also have the red channel, which is essentially a grayscale. The green channel, which is a grayscale. And the blue channel, which is grayscale as well. But what we see is the composite of all of this light together. Why do you keep calling them grayscale? Because they, if I, I, and I actually can create grayscale images this way. I can actually, if I, in fact, some photographers, they'll actually say, I want a black and white version of this photograph. And instead of actually telling, going in, you know, I want to go to Photoshop and I'm going to go to image, color mode, grayscale. Or I'm going to apply a black and white filter to it. They'll actually look at the, all the different channels and see which one has better contrast and values. So, you know, I just, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to claim ignorance here. I don't know enough about shooting specifically to shoot black and white in a digital environment to say that you should shoot grayscale. I would, I'm going to guess. But you're going from bit rate on that as well. Because when you're going from 256 or the 16.7 the million colors, you're getting a complete spectrum of colors of light. When you go to a black and white, then it's only one bit for resolution, black and white. Well, I think she's talking about can you change in your digital camera to tell it to you shoot? Can. Yeah, and you yes, can, you. And I'm not, but I'm not entirely sure if that's advantageous is what I was going to say. Yeah, uh, because I, I'm going to guess that you, you're probably going to be fairly happy with your ability to create black and white grayscale images in a digital environment like Photoshop, a raster editing environment. And then you can have both. You can have both. Yes, yeah. Although I've played with it just like everybody else. And I'll tell you what, man, when I turn my 7D to, bl to black and white, man, those, those images pop. Mm -hmm. They look fantastic. But... I, I've not actually done anything practical with it. It's mostly just like, I'm just going to do this because it's fun right now. <laughs> Would you say pop when you do Photoshop? Yeah. 
You, I mean, there's all kind of, uh, what I was just talking about here is that, I, I, in fact, I talked to you about this in my office the other day, so I'm glad I'm getting the opportunity to say this. In, in digital imaging, in Photoshop, for any one thing that you want to do, and I, and I got this from Rick Carpenter, who I learned a great deal from when I worked at YDOT, uh, for any you know, one thing that you want to achieve in Photoshop, there's a half dozen to a dozen different ways to get there, and they're all correct. So I'm, I'm not going to be fixated on, you know, you didn't do that the way I would have done that. <laughs> because I don't believe there's actually one correct way to do things. So. Because it helps me troubleshoot. And for some of the assignments, there is step by step we're trying to get through here. But, but thank you, smarty pants. <laughs> okay. So when we add, when we have an 8-bit RGB, we actually ha have 24 bits. And the math down here is we have 2 to the 8th, in parentheses, because of order of operations, <laughs> to the 3rd. The result is, for most of our cameras, if we don't change the default settings, we are capturing a, a little bit more than 16.7 million colors. That's a lot of color. That's a lot of colors that we have available to us. And, that's I, I, and I love that it's just all ones and zeros, really. Hey, I just got confused. If you have 8 bits in grayscale, it's 2 to the 8 and it equals 256. But if you have 8 bits in RGB, it's 2 to the 8 and it's 16.7. It's 2 to the 8 to the 3rd. Oh, there's a 3 in there? Okay. Yeah. So now it's 256 times 256 times 256. I get it, I get it. I, I get confused it. you when I said order of operations, didn't I? No. <laughs> I just looked down at the 2 and the 8. 2 and the 8, and I, uh, I can't see the 3 from Well, then move closer. Come on. All right. <clears throat> Digitizing. I, I, I just like to point out that digitizing is just this fancy schmancy word that we've made up that means taking something from our real world and turning it into a digital document. So, and then of course we have our cameras are a way of digitizing, our scanners, which we're going to look at, are a way of digitizing. If you have a digital voice recorder, that's a way of digitizing audio. So uh, it's, we're just taking something from our world and we're turning it into something digital that we can manipulate or store on a computer. <coughs> File types. And then I think I'm going to give us a break after this. I'm getting pretty close. Yay! I wanted to talk a little bit about file types for a couple of reasons. We're only going to deal with a few different types of files in this class. You're typically going to be working with JPEGs. Uh, in, the, in this class, you're going to be using, of course, PSDs. You'll have opportunity to work with TIFFs. And that's probably the limitation for this class. There are all kinds of other file types. Just, I mean, it just goes on and on and on. But I want to talk about uh, some important things to remember about these different file types. And one of the most important things we want to talk about is this thing called compression. Compression is a method by which we take uh, image file sizes, uh, or image files that have a particular size, and we make them smaller so that they are easier to transport and store. They take up less space. Uh, there are two types, essentially, of compression that we have that we call them lossy, lossy and lossless. Uh, and I'm going to talk about, even though lossless is at the bottom, I'm going to talk about it first. There's, an important, there's a reason why. For lossless compression, what's going to happen is, uh, you know, we have this image, and it has some ridiculous, it has 20 megapixels. And uh, when the image is captured, we have some colors, even though there's 16.7 million possible colors, sometimes in, those, those colors are actually going to repeat. So in order to save some space. So then do you really have 16.7 million colors? Yes. 
I'm talking about the, uh, the same color might appear more than once in an image. That's what I'm saying. Uh, Not that we have 16.7 million colors, but we don't really because some of them are actually the same. It's not a conspiracy. <laughs> no, if we have there in an 8-bit RGB, we have possible more than 16.7 million colors mathematically. Different colors. Different colors. Okay. Yes. No, no conspiracy. That's that's true. I am not messing with you. But when we record an image, Let's say we record an image, it's got this nice blue sky in it. It's a fairly consistent blue sky. Is there a chance that even though we have so many different possible colors, that some of those pixels are actually the same color? Okay, this is where compression comes in. And in lossless compression, what the computer's going to do, or the camera's going to do, is it's going to say, instead of, you know, I have, you know, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, this pixel, and this pixel, they're all actually the same color. Instead of writing coordinates and all of the information for that color and then the coordinates and all the information for that color and the coordinates and all the information for the color and the coordinates and all the information for the color and doing that over and over again, it's just going to say, these are all the coordinates for this color of pixel. So it's only writing the color once. And it's saving a lot of data that way. TIFF is one of the file formats that compresses in this manner. PSD compresses in this manner as well. And what happens is, of course, when it decompresses on the other side, it just puts everything back. JPEG is a lossy compression file format. And the reason why we call it lossy is because it's more aggressive. It's going to do something that isn't so nice. In, with JPEGs, when it saves, it's going to say all of these are the same color, which is fine. Same thing that you know, other types of lossless compression do. But then in addition to that, it's going to say, you know what? These ones are only a couple of numbers off. They're pretty close. So, so I'm just going to make them all the same. Okay? For the most part, this is not going to have a great effect on you. If, if, in fact, I'm not going to tell you, don't capture in JPEG, because most of our cameras capture in JPEG, that's just the default. It's OK to capture in JPEG. What I'm going to caution you against is repeatedly opening and saving, opening and saving, opening and saving and while you're editing the file. Because every time you do that, it's going to compress again. And it's going to compress again. And it's going to compress again. There's also, in what you're going to find in Photoshop, uh, levels of a compression. Photoshop's going to say, OK, this is a JPEG. How aggressive do you want me to be in compressing this file? And if you're aggressive, really aggressive in compressing the file, at some point you're going, well, it's not going to be black and white. At some point, you're going to be able to see the degradation in quality. So you'll actually be able to, you'll open the file up and you'll see what uh, posterization. And we'll actually be able to see that there's some problems with the quality. And I'm sure that you've seen some images that have been over compressed or repeatedly compressed and you'll see these problems with the quality. So basically it's removing some of the color. Yes. It's, it's, it's removing like really fine details that in Unless some cases are imper imperceptible. But, in a, but over time, we can perceive them. We can see them. There is a point in time where you can completely lose all the information. Yeah. And where you'll see where where you'll where you'll see examples of what I'm talking about. How many of you guys watch uh, video video on the web? Everybody. Okay. Video uh, uh, web video that it's compressed in the same manner, but in addition to spatial compression, we also have what's called temporal compression, meaning. Uh, each frame is compressed spatially, just the same way that I just talked about with the, uh, with the JPEG. But then we also have, you know, okay, this frame is blue sky and the dog's here. And this frame, the, the blue sky and the dog moved a little bit. Do we really need to write the blue sky over and over again? So, but, so with audio, with, I'm sorry, with video compression, you'll see the same thing. But they'll, because it's, you know, video on the web, 
it, they're really aggressive with it. They have to be. I mean, the video just won't play. I mean, we, we still live in Wyoming. There are still people here that are on dial-up. Okay, we don't have, not everybody has DSL or, you know, what do, I'm trying to think, cable modem, whatever. Yeah, so which, is, which would be the fastest. So, I mean, not everybody has that. But I, I still have students who will, like, take this class and then I talk to them and they're having problems with upload and download and they're, I'm like, well, what's your connection? I'm, di I'm on dial-up. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, so video can be compressed really aggressively. And when you, know, when you see a video and there's like these blocks, it's almost like there's blocks all over the place in it. That's uh, an example of what would happen if you're really aggressive with this type of compression. It's not, the, it's not decompressed on the other side. All I right. What you said about the TIFF. What's that? I missed what you said about the TIFF one. Oh, TIFF is a, is a lossless, uh, well, it has lossless. I, there's an LZW, I think, LZW. That's the compression format that I usually use with tips, TIFFs. And it's, it, it will decrease the file size some. It will help you out a little bit, but it's not super aggressive. Well, aren't you supposed to, um, for whether you're going to print something or you're going to put it on the web, so TIFFs might be better over JPEG, or are there file formats that are better for the web than there are? JPEG is yeah. best for the web. It is? And so printing is... For the most part, and then PNG is also acceptable. Okay, and for printing though, isn't it... T typically TIFF or PSD is what I keep for uh, for printing. I'll send things to press for the, with a TIFF. Uh, where you're going to run into trouble is is that you can't, like I say, I'm going to edit this photo and I'm going to do this really great job and then I'm going to send it to Walmart. Oh, they won't. Have they don't accept TIFFs. <laughs> yeah. So you're still going to have to actually change it to these other, there's one of these other four formats. And I'm not sitting here trying to tell you, I'm not telling you JPEG bad, never use JPEG. <laughs> it's okay to use JPEGs. J JPEGs are wonderful. I mean, they really, th that compression is incredible. What, what it takes, what, what, it, what it'll allow you to, uh, you know, to do. And unless you're really careless and aggressive with it, for the most part, you're not going to see a horrible issue with the quality. What about if you're taking a photo? I know that I take step over to the office, whatever it's called. And you take a graphic that you made, and they like it in PDFs. Does that impact? <coughs> it can. It, dep it depends. PDF is not this incredibly simple thing, one size fits all. There are all kinds of PDF settings. You can actually tell, it, I mean, and it, like, I have Acrobat Pro, and I can actually tell it, this is how big I want my images to be. So it, it's not one size fits all. So I couldn't say. I don't know how you're actually creating your PDFs. All right, break time. I went way longer than I wanted to. And you can actually, what I'm going to be doing for the next portion, I don't need to broadcast. or So you can stop, stop. Bye-bye, online people.